Act One of Quality Street by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Valentine Brown, suitor of Miss Phoebe, read by Thomas Peter. Phoebe Throssell, read by Beth Thomas. Ensign Blades, read by Donald Gilmore. Lieutenant Spicer read by todd miss susan throssell sister to phoebe read by lian yao patty maid of all work in service of the throssell sisters read by abai recruiting sergeant read by alan mapstone an old soldier read by larry wilson arthur Wellesley thompson read by Iki tevi Miss Willoughby, read by J. L. Baldwin. Miss Fanny Willoughby, read by Sonia. Miss Henrietta Turnbull, read by K. Hand. Miss Charlotte Barrett, read by Anna. Isabella, read by Diane Ala E. Lima. Harriet, read by Lauren Emma. A Gallant, read by Iki Tavi. Stage Directions, read by Marianne Spiegel act one the blue and white room the scene is the blue and white room in the house of the misses susan and phoebe throssell in quality street and in this little country town there is a satisfaction about living in quality street which even religion cannot give through the bowed window at the back we have a glimpse of the street it is pleasantly broad and grass-grown and is linked to the outer world by one demure shop whose door rings a bell every time it opens and shuts. Thus, by merely peeping, every one in Quality Street can know at once who has been buying a whimsy cake, and usually why. This bell is the most familiar sound of Quality Street. Now and again ladies pass in their pattens, a maid perhaps protecting them with an umbrella, for flakes of snow are falling discreetly. Gentlemen in the street are an event. But, see, just as we raise the curtain there goes the recruiting sergeant to remind us that we are in the period of the napoleonic wars if he were to look in at the window of the blue and white room all the ladies there assembled would draw themselves up they know him for a rude fellow who smiles at the approach of maiden ladies and continues to smile after they have passed however he lowers his head to-day so that they shall not see him his present design being converse with the Mrs. Throssell's maid. The room is one seldom profaned by the foot of a man, and everything in it is white or blue. Miss Phoebe is not present, but here are Miss Susan, Miss Willoughby, and her sister Miss Fanny, and Miss Henrietta Turnbull. Miss Susan and Miss Willoughby, alas, already wear caps, but all the four are dear ladies so refined that we ought not to be discussing them without a more formal introduction there seems no sufficient reason why we should choose miss phoebe as our heroine rather than any one of the others except perhaps that we like her name best but we gave her the name so we must support our choice and say that she is slightly the nicest unless indeed miss susan is nicer Miss Fanny is reading aloud from a library book while the others sew or knit. They are making garments for our brave soldiers, now far away, fighting the Corsican ogre. And so the day passed, and evening came, black, mysterious, and ghost-like. The wind moaned unceasingly, like a shivering spirit, and the vegetation rustled uneasily, as if something weird and terrifying were about to happen suddenly out of the darkness there emerged a man she says the last word tremulously but without looking up the listeners knit more quickly the unhappy camilla was standing lost in reverie when without pausing to advertise her of his intentions he took both her hands in his by this time the knitting has stopped and all are listening as if mesmerized slowly he gathered her in his arms miss susan gives an excited little cry and rained hot 
burning sister miss fanny greedily on eyes mouth miss willoughby sternly stop miss susan i am indeed surprised you should bring such an amazing indelicate tale from the library miss susan with a slight shudder i deeply regret miss willoughby sees miss fanny reading quickly to herself oh fanny if you please my dear it takes the book gently from her i thank you she knits severely miss fanny a little rebel miss susan is looking at the end miss susan closes the book guiltily miss susan apologetically forgive my partiality for romance mary i fear tis the mark of an old maid susan that word miss susan sweetly tis what i am and you also mary my dear miss fanny defending her sister miss susan i protest miss willoughby sternly truthful nay sister tis true we are known everywhere now susan you and i as the old maids of quality street general discomfort i am happy phoebe will not be an old maid miss henrietta wistfully do you refer miss susan to phoebe miss susan smiles happily to herself miss phoebe of the ringlets as he has called her other females besides miss phoebe have ringlets but you and miss henrietta have to employ papers my dear proudly phoebe never miss willoughby in defence of fanny i do not approve of miss phoebe at all miss susan flushing mary had phoebe been dying you would have called her an angel but that is ever the way tis all jealousy to the bride and good wishes to the corpse her guests rise hurt my love i beg your pardon with your permission miss susan i shall put on my patents miss susan gives permission almost haughtily and the ladies retire to the bedroom miss fanny remaining behind a moment to ask a question a bride miss susan do you mean that v b has declared fanny i expect it hourly miss susan left alone is agitated by the terrible scene with miss willoughby enter phoebe in her bonnet and we see at once that she really is the nicest she is so flushed with delightful news that she almost forgets to take off her pattens before crossing the blue and white room you seem strangely excited phoebe susan i have met a certain individual v b miss phoebe nods several times and her gleaming eyes tell miss susan as much as if they were a romance from the library my dear you are trembling phoebe bravely no oh no you put your hand to your heart did i miss susan in a whisper my love has he offered phoebe appalled oh susan enter miss willoughby partly cloaked how do you do miss phoebe portentously susan i have no wish to alarm you but i am of opinion that there is a man in the house i suddenly felt it while putting on my pattens you mean a follower in the kitchen she courageously rings the bell but her voice falters i am just a little afraid of patty enter patty a buxom young woman who loves her mistresses and smiles at them and knows how to terrorize them patty i hope we may not hurt your feelings but patty sternly are you implicating ma'am that i have a follower oh no patty so be it miss susan ashamed patty come back humbly i told a falsehood just now i am ashamed of myself patty severely as well you might be ma'am phoebe so roused that she would look heroic if she did not spoil the effect by wagging her finger at patty how dare you there is a man in the kitchen to the door with him a glorious soldier to be so treated the door and if he refuses they look perplexed oh dear if he refuses send him here to me exit patty lion-hearted phoebe a soldier nervously 
I wish it may not be that impertinent recruiting sergeant. I passed him in the street today. He closed one of his eyes at me and then quickly opened it. I knew what he meant. He does not come. I think I hear the voices in dispute. She is listening through the floor. They all stoop or go on their knees to listen, and when they are in this position, the recruiting sergeant enters unobserved. He chuckles aloud. In a moment, Phoebe is alone with him. Sergeant, with an Irish accent. Your servant, ma'am. Phoebe, advancing sternly on him. Sir. She is perplexed, as he seems undismayed. Sergeant. She sees mud from his boots on the carpet. Oh, oh. Brushes carpet. Sergeant, I am wishful to scold you, but would you be so obliging as to stand on this paper while I do it? With all the pleasure in life, ma'am. Phoebe, forgetting to be angry. Sergeant, have you killed people? Dozens, ma'am. Dozens. How terrible! Oh, sir, I pray every night that the Lord, in his loving kindness, will root the enemy up. Is it true the Corsican ogre eats babies? I have spoken with them, as I've seen him do it, ma'am. The man of sin! Have you ever seen a vivandier, sir? Wistfully. I have sometimes wished there were vivandiers in the British Army. For a moment she sees herself as one. Oh, sergeant, a shudder goes through me when I see you in the streets enticing those poor young men. If you were one of them, ma'am, and death or glory was the call, you would take the shilling, ma'am. Oh, not for that. For king and country, ma'am? Phoebe, grandly. Yes, yes, for that. Sergeant, candidly. Not that it's all fighting. The sack of captured towns. The loot. Phoebe, proudly. An English soldier never sacks nor loots. No, ma'am. And then, the girls. What girls? In the towns that, that we don't sack. How they must hate the haughty conqueror. We're not so haughty as all that. Phoebe sadly i think i understand i am afraid sergeant you did not tell those poor young men the noble things i thought you told them ma'am i must e'en tell them what they are wishful to hear there have been five ma'am all this week listening to me and then showing me their heels but by a grand stroke of luck i have them at last luck miss susan opens door slightly and listens the luck ma'am is that a gentleman of the town has enlisted that gave them the push forward miss susan is excited a gentleman of this town enlisted eagerly sergeant who ah uh, nay ma'am i think it be a secret as yet but a gentleman tis the most amazing exciting thing sergeant be so obliging nay ma'am i can't miss susan at door carried away by excitement but you must you must sergeant turning to the door you see ma'am the door is hurriedly closed phoebe ashamed sergeant i have not been saying the things i meant to say to you will you please excuse my turning you out of the house somewhat violently i am used to it ma'am i won't really hurt you thank you kindly ma'am phoebe observing the bedroom door opening a little and speaking in a loud voice i protest sir we shall permit no followers in this house should i discover you in my kitchen again i shall pitch you out neck and crop be gone sir the sergeant retires affably all the ladies except miss henrietta come out admiring phoebe the willoughbys are attired for their journey across the street miss phoebe we could not but admire you phoebe alas knows that she is not admirable 
but the gentleman recruit perhaps they will know who he is the woolen drapers let us inquire but before they go miss willoughby has a duty to perform i wish to apologize miss phoebe you are a dear good girl if i have made remarks about her ringlet susan it was jealousy phoebe and miss susan wish to embrace her but she is not in the mood for it come sister miss fanny the dear woman that she is phoebe dear i wish you very happy phoebe presses her hand miss henrietta entering and not to be outdone miss phoebe i give you joy the three ladies go the two younger ones a little tearfully and we see them pass the window phoebe pained susan you have been talking to them about v b i could not help it eagerly now phoebe what is it you have to tell me phoebe in a low voice dear i think it is too holy to speak of dear sister susan as you know i was sitting with an unhappy woman whose husband has fallen in the war when i came out of the cottage he was passing yes he offered me his escort at first he was very silent as he has often been of late we know why please not to say that i know why suddenly he stopped and swung his cane you know how gallantly he swings his cane yes indeed he said i have something i am wishful to tell you miss phoebe perhaps you can guess what it is go on to say i could guess sister would have been unladylike i said please not to tell me in the public thoroughfare to which he instantly replied then i shall call and tell you this afternoon phoebe they are interrupted by the entrance of patty with tea they see that she has brought three cups and know that this is her impertinent way of implying that mistresses as well as maids may have a follower when she has gone they smile at the daring of the woman and sit down to tea susan to think that it has all happened in a single year such a genteel competency as he can offer such a desirable establishment i had no thought of that dear i was recalling our first meeting at mrs fotheringay's quadrille party we had quite forgotten that a respected local physician was growing elderly until he said allow me to present my new partner mr valentine brown phoebe do you remember how at the tea-table he facetiously passed the cake-basket with nothing in it he was so amusing from the first i am thankful susan that i too have a sense of humour i am exceedingly funny at times am i not susan yes indeed but he sees humour in the most unexpected things i say something so ordinary about loving for instance to have everything either blue or white in this room and i know not why he laughs but it makes me feel quite witty phoebe a little anxiously i hope he sees nothing odd or quaint about us my dear i am sure he cannot susan the picnics phoebe the day when he first drank tea in this house he invited himself he merely laughed when i said it would cause such talk he is absolutely fearless susan he has smoked his pipe in this room they are both a little scared smoking is indeed a dreadful habit but there is something so dashing about it miss susan with melancholy and now i am to be left alone no my dear i could not leave this room my lovely blue and white room it is my husband phoebe who has become agitated susan you must make my house your home i have something distressing to tell you you alarm me you know mr brown advised us how to invest half of our money i know it gives us eight per cent though why it should do so i cannot understand but very obliging i am sure susan all that money is lost i had the letter several days ago lost something burst dear and then they absconded but mr brown i have not advertised him of it yet for he will think it was his fault but i shall tell him to-day phoebe how much have we left only sixty pounds a year so you see you must live with us dearest but mr brown he phoebe grandly 
he is a man of means and if he is not proud to have my susan i shall say at once mr brown the door she presses her cheek to miss susan's miss susan softly phoebe i have a wedding gift for you not yet it has been ready for a long time i began it when you were not ten years old and i was a young woman i meant it for myself phoebe i had hoped that he his name was william but i think i must have been too unattractive my love sweetest dearest i always associate it with a sprigged poplin i was wearing that summer with a breadth of coloured silk in it being a naval officer but something happened a miss cicely pemberton and they are quite big boys now so long ago phoebe he was very tall with brown hair it was most foolish of me but i was always so fond of sewing with long straight legs and such a pleasant expression susan what was it it was a wedding gown my dear even plain women phoebe we can't help it when we are young we have romantic ideas just as if we were pretty and so the wedding gown was never used long before it was finished i knew he would not offer but i finished it and then i put it away i have always hidden it from you phoebe but of late i have brought it out again and altered it she goes to ottoman and unlocks it susan i could not wear it miss susan brings the wedding gown oh how sweet how beautiful you will wear it my love won't you and the tears it was sewn with long ago will all turn into smiles on my phoebe's wedding day they are tearfully happy when a knock is heard on the street door that knock so dashing so imperious she is suddenly panic-stricken susan i think he kissed me once miss susan startled you think i know he did that evening a week ago when he was squiring me home from the concert it was raining and my face was wet he said that was why he did it because your face was wet it does not seem a sufficient excuse now miss susan appalled oh phoebe before he had offered phoebe in distress i fear me it was most unladylike valentine brown is shown in he is a frank genial young man of twenty-five who honestly admires the ladies though he is amused by their quaintness he is modestly aware that it is in the blue and white room alone that he is esteemed a wit miss susan how do you do ma'am nay miss phoebe though we have met to-day already i insist on shaking hands with you again always so dashing valentine laughs and the ladies exchange delighted smiles valentine to miss susan and my other friends i hope i find them in health the spinet ma'am seems quite herself to-day i trust that ottoman passed a good night miss susan beaming we are quite well sir may i sit on this chair miss phoebe i know miss susan likes me to break her chairs indeed sir i do not phoebe how strange that he should think so phoebe instantly the remark was humorous was it not how you see through me miss phoebe the sisters again exchange delighted smiles a valentine is about to take a seat miss susan thinking aloud oh dear i feel sure he is going to roll the coverlet into a ball and then sit on it valentine who has been on the point of doing so abstains and sits guiltily so i am dashing miss susan am i dashing miss phoebe a little i think well but i have something to tell you to-day which i really think is rather dashing miss susan gathers her knitting looks at phoebe and is preparing to go you are not going ma'am before you know what it is i uh, i in indeed to be sure I, I know mr brown susan i mean i do not know i mean i can guess i mean phoebe my love explain she goes out valentine rather disappointed the explanation being i suppose that you both know that i had flattered myself to such a secret am i then to understand that you had foreseen it all miss phoebe nay sir you must not ask that i believe in any case twas you who first put it into my head phoebe aghast oh i hope not your demure eyes flashed so every time the war was mentioned 
the little Quaker suddenly looked like a gallant boy in ringlets. A dread comes over Phoebe, but it is in her heart alone. It shows neither in face nor voice. Mr. Brown, what is it you have to tell us? That I have enlisted, Miss Phoebe. Did you surmise it was something else? You are going to the wars? Mr. Brown, is it a jest? It would be a sorry jest, ma'am. I thought you knew. I concluded that the recruiting sergeant had talked. The recruiting sergeant? I see. These stirring times, Miss Phoebe. He is but half a man who stays at home. I have chafed for months. I want to see whether I have any courage. And as to be an army surgeon does not appeal to me, it was enlist or remain behind. Today I found that there were five waverers. I asked them would they take the shilling if I took it, and they assented. Miss Phoebe, it is not one man I give to the king, but six. Phoebe, brightly, I think you have done bravely. We leave shortly for the Petersburg barracks, and I go to London tomorrow. So this is goodbye. I shall pray that you may be preserved in battle, Mr. Brown. And you and Miss Susan will write to me when occasion offers? If you wish it. Valentine, smiling. With all the stirring news of Quality Street. It seems stirring to us. It must have been merely laughable to you, who came here from a great city. Dear Quality Street, that thought me dashing. But I made friends in it, Miss Phoebe, of two very sweet ladies. Phoebe, timidly. Mr. Brown, I wonder why you have been so kind to my sister and me. The kindness was yours, if at first Miss Susan amused me. A chuckling. To see her on her knees decorating the little legs of the couch with frills as if it were a child. But it was her sterling qualities that impressed me presently. And did, did I amuse you also? Prodigiously, Miss Phoebe. Those other ladies, they were always scolding you. Your youthfulness shocked them. I believe they thought you dashing. Phoebe, nervously. I have sometimes feared that I was perhaps too dashing. Valentine, laughing at this. You delicious Miss Phoebe. You were too quiet. I felt sorry that one so sweet and young should live so grey a life. I wondered whether I could put any little pleasures into it. The picnics. It was very good of you. That was only how it began, for soon I knew that it was I who got the pleasures, and you who gave them. You have been to me, Miss Phoebe, like... A quiet, old-fashioned garden full of the flowers that Englishmen love best, because they have known them longest. The daisy that stands for innocence, and the hyacinth for constancy, and the modest violet and the rose. When I am far away, ma'am, I shall often think of Miss Phoebe's pretty soul, which is her garden, and shut my eyes and walk in it. She is smiling gallantly through her pain when Miss Susan returns. Have you... Is it you seem so calm, Phoebe? Phoebe, pressing her sister's hand warningly and imploringly. Susan, what Mr. Brown is so obliging as to inform us of is not what we expected, not that at all. My dear, he is the gentleman who has enlisted, and he came to tell us that, and to say good-bye. Going away? Yes, dear. Am I not the ideal recruit, ma'am? A man without a wife, or a mother, or a sweetheart? No, sweetheart. Have you one for me, Miss Susan? Phoebe, hastily, lest her sister's face should betray the truth. Susan, we shall have to tell him now. You dreadful man, you will laugh and say it is just like Quality Street. But, indeed, since I met you today and you told me you had something to communicate, we have been puzzling what it could be, and uh, we concluded that you were going to be married. <laughs> Was that it? So like women, you know. We thought perhaps we knew her. A glancing at the wedding gown. We were even discussing what we should wear at the wedding. Ha, <laughs> ha! I should often think of this. I wonder who would have me, Miss Susan. Rising. But I must be off, and God bless you both. Miss Susan, forlorn. You are going. No more mud on your carpet, Miss Susan. No more coverlets rolled into balls. A good riddance. Miss Phoebe, a last look at the garden taking her hand and looking into her face. We shall miss you very much, Mr. Brown. There is one little matter. 
that investment I advise you to make. I am happy it has turned out so well. Phoebe, checking Miss Susan, who is about to tell of the loss of the money. It was good of you to take all that trouble, sir. Accept our grateful thanks. Indeed, I am glad that you are so comfortably left. I am your big brother. Goodbye again. Looks round. This little blue and white room and its dear inmates. May they be unchanged when I come back. Goodbye. He goes. Miss Susan looks forlornly at Phoebe, who smiles pitifully. A misunderstanding. Just a mistake. She shudders, lifts the wedding gown, and puts it back in the ottoman. Miss Susan sinks, sobbing into a chair. Don't, dear, don't. We can live it down. Miss Susan, fiercely. He is a fiend in human form. Nay, you heard me, sister. He is a brave gentleman. The money. Why did you not let me tell him? Phoebe, flushing. So that he might offer to me out of pity, Susan? Phoebe, how are we to live with a quarter and loaf at one and ten pence? Brother James. You know very well that Brother James will do nothing for us. I think, Susan, we could keep a little school. For genteel children only, of course. I would do most of the teaching. You, a schoolmistress. Phoebe of the ringlets, everyone would laugh. I shall hide the ringlets away in a cap like yours, Susan, and people will soon forget them. And I shall try to look staid and to grow old quickly. It will not be so hard to me as you think, dear. There were other gentlemen who were attracted by you, Phoebe, and you turned from them. I did not want them. They will come again, and others. No, dear, never speak of that to me any more. In woe. I let him kiss me. You could not prevent him. Yes, I could. I know I could now. I wanted him to do it. Oh, never speak to me of others after that. Perhaps he saw I wanted it and did it to please me, but I meant, indeed I did, that I gave it to him with all my love. Sister, I could bear all the rest, but I have been unladylike. The curtain falls, and we do not see the sisters again for ten years. End of Act One Act Two of Quality Street by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two The School. Ten years later. It is the blue and white room still, but many of Miss Susan's beautiful things have gone, some of them never to return. Others are stored upstairs. Their place is taken by grim scholastic furniture, forms, a desk, a globe, a blackboard, heartless maps. It is here that Miss Phoebe keeps school. Miss Susan teaches in the room opening off it, once the spare bedroom, where there is a smaller blackboard, for easier sums, but no globe, as Miss Susan is easily alarmed. Here are the younger pupils, unless they have grown defiant, when they are promoted to the blue and white room to be under Miss Phoebe's braver rule. They really frighten Miss Phoebe also, but she does not let her sister know this. It is noon on a day in August, and through the window we can see that Quality Street is decorated with flags. We also hear at times martial music from another street. Miss Phoebe is giving a dancing lesson to half a dozen pupils, and is doing her very best. Now she is at the spinet while they dance, and again she is showing them the new step. We know it is Miss Phoebe, because some of her pretty airs and graces still cling to her in a forlorn way, but she is much changed. Her curls are out of sight under a cap. Her manner is prim. The light has gone from her eyes, and buoyancy from her figure. She looks not ten years older, but twenty, and not an easy twenty. When the children are not looking at her, we know that she has a headache. Phoebe, who is sometimes at the spinet and sometimes dancing. Toes out, so. Chest out, Georgie. Point your toes, Miss Beveridge, so. So, keep in line, and young ladies, remember your toes. Gregory, in his desire to please, has protruded the wrong part of his person. She writes a C on his chest with chalk. C stands for chest, Georgie. This is S. 
miss susan darts out of the other room she is less worn than miss phoebe miss susan whispering so that the pupils may not hear phoebe how many are fourteen and seventeen phoebe almost instantly thirty-one i thank you she darts off that will do ladies and gentlemen you may go they bow or curtsey and retire to miss susan's room with the exception of arthur wellesley thompson who is standing in disgrace in a corner with the cap of shame on his head and isabella a forbidding-looking learned little girl isabella holds up her hand for permission to speak please ma'am father wishes me to acquire algebra phoebe with a sinking algebra it is not a very ladylike study isabella father says will you or won't you and you are thin it will make you thinner my dear father says i am thin but wiry yes you are with feeling you are very wiry isabella father says either i acquire algebra or i go to miss prothero's establishment very well i i will do my best you may go isabella goes and phoebe sits wearily arthur fingering his cap please ma'am may i take it off now certainly not unhappy boy arthur grins come here are you ashamed of yourself arthur blithely no ma'am phoebe in a terrible voice arthur wellesley thompson fetch me the implement arthur goes briskly for the cane and she hits the desk with it arthur surely that terrifies you no ma'am arthur why did you fight with that street boy because he said that when you caned you did not draw blood but i don't do i no ma'am then why fight him remembering how strange boys are was it for the honour of the school yes ma'am say you are sorry arthur and i won't punish you he bursts into tears <gasps> you promised to cane me and now you are not going to do it phoebe incredulous do you wish to be caned arthur holding out his hand eagerly if you please miss phoebe unnatural boy she canes him in a very unprofessional manner poor dear boy she kisses the hand oh ma'am you will never be able to cane if you hold it like that you should hold it like this miss phoebe and give it a wriggle like that she is too soft-hearted to follow his instructions phoebe almost in tears go away arthur remembering that women are strange don't cry ma'am i love you miss phoebe she seats him on her knee and he thinks of a way to please her if any boy says you can't cane i will blood him miss phoebe phoebe shudders and miss susan again darts in she signs to phoebe to send arthur away miss susan as soon as arthur has gone phoebe if a herring and a half cost three halfpence, how many for eleven pence? Phoebe, instantly. Eleven. William Smith says it is fifteen, and he is such a big boy. Do you think I ought to contradict him? May I say there are differences of opinion about it? No one can be really sure, Phoebe. It is eleven. I once worked it out with real herrings. Stoutly. Susan, we must never let the big boys know that we are afraid of them to awe them stamp with the foot speak in a ferocious voice and look them unflinchingly in the face then she pales oh susan isabella's father insists on her acquiring algebra what is algebra exactly is it those three cornered things it is x minus y equals z plus y and things like that and all the time you are saying they are equal you feel in your heart why should they be the music of the band swells here and both ladies put their hands to their ears it is the band for tonight's ball we must not grudge their rejoicing susan it is not every year there is a waterloo to celebrate i was not thinking of that i was thinking that he is to be at the ball tonight and we have not seen him for ten years phoebe 
calmly yes ten years we shall be glad to welcome our old friend back susan i am going into your room now to take the latin class a soldier with a girl passes a yokel follows angrily oh that weary latin i wish i had the whipping of the man who invented it she returns to her room and the sound of the music dies away miss phoebe who is not a very accomplished classical scholar is taking a final peep at the declensions when miss susan reappears excitedly what is it miss susan tragically william smith phoebe i tried to look ferocious indeed i did but he saw i was afraid and before the whole school he put out his tongue at me susan she is lion-hearted she remembers arthur's instructions and practices with the cane miss susan frightened phoebe he is much too big let it pass if i let it pass i am a stumbling-block in the way of true education sister phoebe grandly susan stand aside giving the cane arthur's most telling flick she marches into the other room then while miss susan is listening nervously captain valentine brown is ushered in by patty he is bronzed and soldierly he wears the whiskers of the period and is in uniform he has lost his left hand but this is not at first noticeable miss susan tis captain brown captain brown valentine greeting her warmly reports himself at home again miss susan gratified you call this home when the other men talked of their homes miss susan i thought of this room looking about him maps desks hey ho but still it is the same dear room i have often dreamt miss susan that i came back to it in muddy shoes seeing her alarm i have not you know miss susan i rejoice to find no change in you and miss phoebe miss phoebe of the ringlets i hope there be as little change in her miss susan painfully phoebe of the ringlets oh captain brown you need not expect to see her she is not here i vow it spoils all my homecoming at this moment the door of the other room is filing open and phoebe rushes out followed by william smith who is brandishing the cane valentine takes in the situation and without looking at phoebe seizes william by the collar and marches him out of the school phoebe did you see who it is i saw in a sudden tremor susan i have lost all my looks the pupils are crowding in from miss susan's room and she orders them back and goes with them valentine returns and speaks as he enters not recognizing phoebe whose back is to him a young reprobate madam but i have deposited him on the causeway i fear he stops puzzled because the lady has covered her face with her hands captain brown miss phoebe it is you he goes to her but he cannot help showing that her appearance is a shock to him phoebe without bitterness yes i have changed very much i have not worn well captain brown valentine awkwardly we we are both older miss phoebe he holds out his hand warmly with affected high spirits phoebe smiling reproachfully it was both hands when you went away he has to show that his left hand is gone she is overcome oh i did not know she presses the empty sleeve in remorse you never mentioned it in your letters valentine now grown rather stern miss phoebe what did you omit from your letters that you had such young blackguards that to terrify you he is the only one most of them are dear children and this is the last day of the term ah ma'am if only you had invested all your money as you laid out part by my advice what a monstrous pity you did not we never thought of it you look so tired i have the headache to-day you did not used to have the headache curse those dear children phoebe bravely nay do not distress yourself about me tell me of yourself 
We are so proud of the way in which you won your commission. Will you leave the army now? Yes, and I have some intention of pursuing again the old life in Quality Street. He is not a man who has reflected much. He has come back thinking that all the adventures have been his, and that the old life in Quality Street has waited, as in a sleep, to be resumed on the day of his return. I came here in such high spirits, Miss Phoebe. Phoebe, with a wry smile. The change in me depresses you. I was in hopes that you and Miss Susan would be going to the ball. I had brought cards for you with me to make sure. She is pleased, and means to accept. He sighs, and she understands that he thinks her too old. But now you see that my dancing days are done. Valentine, uncomfortably. Uh, no. Phoebe, in taking care he shall not see that he has hurt her. But you will find many charming partners. Some of them have been my pupils. There was even a pupil of mine who fought at Waterloo. Young Blades, I have heard him on it. She puts her hand wearily to her head. Miss Phoebe, what a dull grey world it is. She turns away to hide her emotion, and Miss Susan comes in. Phoebe, I have said that you will not take Latin class today, and I am dismissing them. Latin? Phoebe rather defiantly. I am proud to teach it. Breaking down. Susan, his arm, have you seen? Miss Susan is also overcome, but recovers as the children crowd in. Hats off, gentlemen salute, ladies curtsy, to the brave Captain Brown. The Captain Brown salutes them awkwardly, and they cheer him, to his great discomfort, as they pass out. Valentine, when they have gone. A terrible ordeal, ma'am. The old friends look at each other, and there is a silence. Valentine feels that all the fine tales and merry jests he has brought back for the ladies have turned into dead things. He wants to go away and think. I wish you very happy at the ball. Valentine, sighing. Miss Susan, cannot we turn all these maps and horrors out till the vacation is over? Indeed, sir, we always do. By tomorrow, this will be my dear blue and white room again, and that my sweet spare bedroom. For five weeks. Valentine, making vain belief. And then the, uh, the dashing Mr. Brown will drop in as of old, and behold Miss Susan on her knees once more, putting tucks into my little friend the Ottoman, and Miss Phoebe, <sighs> Miss Phoebe. Phoebe of the ringlets. She goes out quietly. Miss Susan, what a shame it is. Yes, it is a shame. Valentine, suddenly become more of a man. The brave Captain Brown. Good God, ma'am, how much more brave are the ladies who keep a school. Patty shows in two visitors, Miss Charlotte Parrot and Ensign Blades. Charlotte is a pretty minx, who we are glad to say does not reside in Quality Street, and Blades is a callow youth, inviting admiration. Charlotte, as they salute. But I did not know you had company, Miss Susan. Tis Captain Brown, Miss Charlotte Parrot. Charlotte, gushing. The Aurora Brown? Alas, no, ma'am, the other one. Miss Susan, do you see who accompanies me? I cannot quite recall. A few years ago, ma'am, there sat in this room a scrubby, inky little boy. I was that boy. Can it be a rod pupil? And sign blades? She thinks him very fine, and he bows, well pleased. Once a little boy, and now you're most obedient, ma'am. You've come to recall old memories? And not precisely. I... Charlotte, explain. And Sim Blades wishes me to say that it must seem highly romantic to you to have had a pupil who has fought at Waterloo. Not exactly romantic. I trust, sir, that when you speak of having been our pupil, you were also so obliging as to mention that it was during our first year. Otherwise it makes us seem so elderly. He bows again, in what he believes to be a quizzical manner. Ensign Blades would be pleased to hear, Miss Susan, what you think of him as a whole. Indeed, sir, I think you are monstrous fine. Innocently. It quite awes me to remember we used to whip him. 
Valentine, delighted. With to Miss Susan. In solemn burlesque of Charlotte. Ensign Blades wishes to indicate that it was more than Bonaparte could do. We shall meet again, bright boy. He makes his adieu and goes. Do you think he was quizzing me? Miss Susan, simply. I cannot think so. He said bright boy, ma'am. I am sure, sir, he did not mean it. Phoebe returns. Charlotte, I am happy to see you. You look delicious, my dear, so young and fresh. La, do you think so, Miss Phoebe? Miss Phoebe, you're obedient. It is Ensign Blades, but how kind of you, sir, to revisit the old school. Please do sit down. Ensign Blades has a favour to ask of you, Miss Phoebe. I learned, ma'am, that Captain Brown has obtained a card for you for the ball, and I am here to solicit for the honour of standing up with you. For a moment Phoebe is flattered. Here, she believes, is someone who does not think her too old for the dance. Then she perceives a meaning smile pass between Charlotte and the ensign. Phoebe, paling. Is it that you desire to make sport of me? Blades, honestly distressed. Oh, no, ma'am, I vow, uh, but I, I am such a quiz, ma'am. Sister! I am sorry, sir, to have to deprive you of some entertainment, but I am not going to the ball. Miss Susan, haughtily. And sign, Blades, I bid you my adieu. Blades, ashamed. If I have hurt Miss Phoebe's feelings, I beg to apologize. If you have hurt them. Oh, sir! How is it possible for any one to be as silly as you seem to be? Blades, who cannot find the answer. Charlotte, explain. But Charlotte considers that their visit has not been sufficiently esteemed, and departs with a cold curtsy, taking him with her. Miss Susan turns sympathetically to Phoebe, but Phoebe, fighting with her pain, sits down at the spinet, and plays at first excitedly a gay tune, then slowly, then comes to a stop with her head bowed. Soon she jumps up courageously, brushes away her distress, gets an algebra book from the desk, and sits down to study it. Miss Susan is at the window, where ladies and gentlemen are now seen passing in ball attire. What book is it, Phoebe? It is an algebra. They are going by to the ball. In anger. My Phoebe should be going to the ball, too. You jest, Susan. Miss Susan watches her read. Phoebe has to wipe away a tear. Soon she rises and gives way to the emotion she has been suppressing ever since the entrance of Valentine. Susan, I hate him. Oh, Susan, I could hate him if it were not for his poor hand. My dear, he thought I was old because I am weary, and he should not have forgotten. I am only thirty. Susan, why does thirty seem so much more than twenty-nine? As if Valentine were present. Oh, sir, how dare you look so pityingly at me? Because I have had to work so hard. Is it a crime when a woman works? Because I have tried to be courageous? Have I been courageous, Susan? God knows you have. But it has given me the headache. It has tired my eyes. Alas, Miss Phoebe, all your charm has gone, for you have the headache and your eyes are tired. He is dancing with Charlotte Parrot now, Susan. I vow, Miss Charlotte, you are selfish and silly, but you are sweet eighteen. Oh, la, Captain Brown, what a quiz you are! That delights him, Susan. See how he waggles his silly head. Charlotte Parrot is a goose. Tis what gentlemen prefer. If there were a sufficient number of geese to go round, Susan, no woman of sense would ever get a husband. Charming, Miss Charlotte, you are like a garden. Miss Phoebe was like a garden once, but tis a faded garden now. If to be ladylike. Susan, I am tired of being ladylike. I am a young woman still, and to be ladylike is not enough. I wish to be bright and thoughtless and merry. It is every woman's birthright to be petted and admired. I wish to be petted and admired. Was I born to be confined within these four walls? Are they the world, Susan, or is there anything beyond them? I want to know. My eyes are tired because for ten years they have seen nothing but maps and desks. Ten years! Ten years ago I went to bed a young girl, and I woke with this cap on my head. 
it is not fair this is not me susan this is some other person i want to be myself phoebe phoebe you have always been so patient oh no not always if you only knew how i have rebelled at times you would turn from me in horror susan i have a picture of myself as i used to be i sometimes look at it i sometimes kiss it and say poor girl they have all forgotten you but i remember i cannot recall it i keep it locked away in my room would you like to see it i shall bring it down my room oh susan it is there that the phoebe you think so patient has the hardest fight with herself for there i have seemed to hear and see the phoebe of whom this looking at herself is but an image in a distorted glass i have heard her singing as if she thought she was still a girl i have heard her weeping perhaps it was only i who was weeping but she seemed to cry to me let me out of this prison give me back the years you have taken from me oh where are my pretty curls she cries where is my youth my youth she goes out leaving miss susan woeful presently susan takes up the algebra book and reads a stroke b multiplied by b stroke c equal a b stroke little two stroke a c add b c poor phoebe multiply by c stroke a and we get poor phoebe c a b stroke little two stroke a c little two add b c oh i cannot believe it stroke little two again add a b little two add a little two c stroke a b c patty comes in with the lamp hurting your poor eyes reading without a lamp think shame miss susan miss susan with spirit patty i will not be dictated to patty looks out at the window draw the curtains at once i cannot allow you to stand gazing at the foolish creatures who crowd to a ball patty closing curtains i am not gazing at them ma'am i am gazing at my sweetheart your sweetheart i did not know you had one nor have i ma'am as yet but i looks out and thinks i to myself at any moment he may turn the corner i have been looking out at windows waiting for him to oblige by turning the corner this fifteen years fifteen years and still you are hopeful there's not a more hopeful woman in all the king's dominions you who are so much older than miss phoebe yes ma'am i had the advantage of her by ten years it would be idle to pretend that you are specially comely that may be but my face is my own and the more i see it in the glass the more it pleases me i never look at it but i say to myself who is to be the lucky man tis wonderful this will be a great year for females ma'am think of how many of the men that marched away strutting to the wars have come back limping who is to take off their wooden legs of an evening miss susan you ma'am or me patty or miss phoebe with feeling the pretty thing that she was miss susan do you remember patty i think there is no other person who remembers unless it be the mrs willoughby and miss henrietta patty eagerly give her a chance ma'am and take her to the balls there be three of them this week and the last ball will be the best for it is to be at the barracks and you will need a carriage to take you there and there will be the packing of you into it by gallant squires and the unpacking of you out and other devilries patty if miss phoebe were to dress young again and put candles in her eyes that used to be so bright and coax back her curls phoebe returns and a great change has come over her she is young and pretty again she is wearing the wedding gown of act one her ringlets are glorious her figure youthful her face flushed and animated patty is the first to see her and is astonished phoebe signs to her to go phoebe when patty has gone susan miss susan sees and is speechless susan this is the picture of my old self that i keep locked away in my room and sometimes take out of its box to look at this is the girl who kisses herself in the glass and sings and dances with glee until i put her away frightened lest you should hear her how marvellous oh phoebe 
perhaps i should not do it but it is so easy i have but to put on the old wedding gown and tumble my curls out of the cap passionately sister am i as changed as he says i am you almost frighten me the band is heard the music is calling to us susan i will celebrate waterloo in a little ball of my own see my curls have begun to dance they are so anxious to dance one dance susan to phoebe of the ringlets and then i will put her away in her box and never look at her again ma'am may i have the honour nay then i shall dance alone she dances oh susan i almost wish i were a goose presently patty returns she gazes at miss phoebe dancing miss phoebe phoebe still dancing not miss phoebe patty i am not myself to-night i am let me see i am my niece patty in a whisper to susan but miss susan tis captain brown oh stop phoebe stop nay let him see her miss susan hurries scandalized into the other room as valentine enters i venture to come back because phoebe turns to him he stops abruptly bewildered i beg your pardon madam i thought it was miss susan or miss phoebe his mistake surprises her but she is in a wild mood and curtsies then turns away and smiles he stares as if half convinced patty with an inspiration tis my mistress's niece sir she's on a visit here he is deceived he bows gallantly then remembers the object of his visit he produces a bottle of medicine patty i obtained this at the apothecary's for miss phoebe's headache it should be taken at once miss phoebe is lying down sir is she asleep patty demurely no sir i think she be wide awake it may soothe her patty take it to aunt phoebe at once patty goes out sedately with the medicine valentine after a little awkwardness which phoebe enjoys perhaps i may venture to present myself miss uh, miss uh... miss livy sir i am captain brown miss livy an old friend of both your aunts phoebe curtsying i have heard them speak of a dashing mr brown but i think it cannot be the same valentine a little chagrined why not ma'am i ask your pardon sir i was sure you must be related indeed for a moment the likeness even the voice phoebe pouting la sir you mean i am like aunt phoebe every one says so and indeed tis no compliment twould have been a compliment once you must be a daughter of the excellent mr james throstle who used to reside at great buckland he is still there a tedious twenty miles from here as i remember la i have found the journey a monstrous quick one sir the band is again heard she runs to the window to peep between the curtains and his eyes follow her admiringly valentine eagerly miss livy you go to the ball alas sir i have no card i have two cards for your aunts as miss phoebe has the headache your aunt susan must take you to the ball oh oh her feet move to the music sir i cannot control my feet they are already at the ball ma'am you must follow them phoebe with all the pent-up mischief of ten years oh sir do you think some pretty gentleman might be partial to me at the ball if that is your wish i should love sir to inspire frenzy in the breast of the male with sudden collapse i dare not go i dare not miss livy i vow he turns eagerly to miss susan who enters i have ventured miss susan to introduce myself to your charming niece miss susan would like to run away again but the wicked miss phoebe is determined to have her help aunt susan do not be angry with your livy your livy aunt susan this gentleman says he is the dashing mr brown he has cards for us for the ball auntie of course we cannot go we dare not go oh auntie hasten into your bombazine miss susan staggered phoebe aunt phoebe wants me to go if i say she does you know she does 
but my dear my dear oh auntie why do you talk so much come come i shall see to it miss susan that your niece has a charming ball he means he will find me sweet partners nay ma'am i mean i shall be your partner phoebe who is not an angel aunt susan he still dances still ma'am oh sir you are indeed dashing nay sir please not to scowl i could not avoid noticing them noticing what miss livy the grey hairs sir i vow ma'am there is not one in my head he is such a quiz i so love a quiz then ma'am i shall do nothing but quiz you at the ball miss susan i beg you oh sir dissuade her nay i entreat auntie think my dear think we dare not phoebe shuddering no we dare not i cannot go indeed ma'am tis impossible she really means it and had not the music here taken an unfair advantage of her it is certain that miss phoebe would never have gone to the ball in after years she and miss susan would have talked together of the monstrous evening when she nearly lost her head but regained it before it could fall off but suddenly the music swells so alluringly that it is a thousand fingers beckoning her to all the balls she has missed and in a transport she whirls miss susan from the blue and white room to the bedchamber where is the bombazine valentine awaits their return like a conqueror until miss livy's words about his hair return to trouble him he is stooping gazing intently into a small mirror extracting the grey hairs one by one when patty ushers in the sisters willoughby and miss henrietta miss henrietta is wearing the new veil which opens or closes like curtains when she pulls a string she opens it now to see what he is doing and the slight sound brings him to his feet tis but the new veil sir there is no cause for alarm they have already learned from patty we may be sure that he is in the house but they express genteel surprise mary surely we are addressing the gallant captain brown it is a mrs willoughby and miss henrietta tis indeed a gratification to renew acquaintance with such elegant and respectable females the greetings are elaborate you have seen miss phoebe sir i've had the honour miss phoebe i regret to say is now lying down with a headache the ladies are too delicately minded to exchange glances before a man but they are privately of opinion that this meeting after ten years with the dazzling brown has laid miss phoebe low they are in a twitter of sympathy with her and yearning to see miss susan alone so that they may draw from her an account of the exciting meeting you do not favour the ball to-night i confess balls are distasteful to me twill be a mixed assembly i am credibly informed that the woollen draper's daughter has obtained a card valentine gravely good god ma'am is it possible we shall probably spend the evening here with miss susan at the card table but miss susan goes with me to the ball ma'am this is scarcely less exciting to them than the overthrow of the corsican nay i hope there be no impropriety miss livy will accompany her miss willoughby bewildered miss livy their charming niece the ladies repeat the word in a daze they had not apprised us that they have a visitor they think this reticence unfriendly and are wondering whether they ought not to retire hurt when miss susan enters in her bombazine wraps and bonnet she starts at the sight of them and has the bearing of a guilty person miss willoughby stiffly we have but now been advertised of your intention for this evening susan we deeply regret our intrusion miss susan wistfully please not to be piqued mary twas so sodden i cannot remember susan that your estimable brother had a daughter i thought all the three were sons miss susan with deplorable readiness three sons and a daughter surely you remember little livy mary miss willoughby bluntly no susan i do not i i must go i hear livy calling miss fanny tartly i hear nothing but the band we are not to see your niece another time to-morrow pray rest a little before you depart mary i phoebe livy the headache 
but before she can go another lady enters gaily ah here is miss livy the true culprit is more cunning than miss susan and before they can see her she quickly pulls the strings of her bonnet which is like miss henrietta's and it obscures her face this this is my niece livy miss willoughby miss henrietta miss fanny willoughby ladies excuse my impatience but one moment sir may i ask you miss livy how many brothers you have two i thank you she looks strangely at miss susan and miss phoebe knows that she has blundered at a venture excluding the unhappy thomas miss susan clever for the only moment in her life we never mention him they are swept away in the arms of the impatient captain what has thomas done they have no suspicion as yet of what miss phoebe has done but they believe there is a scandal in the throstle family and they will not sleep happily until they know what it is end of act two Act Three of Quality Street by J. M. Barrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, the ball, a ball, but not the one to which we have seen Miss Susan and Miss Phoebe rush forth upon their career of crime. This is the third of the series, the one of which Patty has foretold with horrid relish that it promises to be specially given over to devilries. The scene is a canvas pavilion, used as a retiring room and for card play, and through an opening in the back we have glimpses of gay uniforms and fair ladies intermingled in the bravery of the dance. There is coming and going through this opening, and also through slits in the canvas. The pavilion is fantastically decorated in various tastes, and is lit with lanterns. A good-natured moon, nevertheless, shines into it benignantly. Some of the card-tables are neglected, but at one a game of quadrille is in progress. There is much movement and hilarity, but none from one side of the tent, where sit several young ladies, all pretty, all appealing, and all woeful. For no gallant comes to ask them if he may have the felicity. The nervous woman chaperoning them, and afraid to meet their gaze lest they scowl or weep in reply is no other than miss susan the most unhappy miss susan we have yet seen she sits there gripping her composure in both hands far less susceptible to shame is the brazen phoebe who may be seen passing the opening on the arm of a cavalier and flinging her trembling sister a mischievous kiss the younger ladies note the incident alas they are probably meant to notice it and they cower as under a blow harriet a sad-eyed large girl who we hope found a romance at her next ball are we so disagreeable that no one will dance with us miss susan is infamous they have eyes for no one but your niece miss livy has taken ensign blades from me if miss phoebe were here I am sure she would not allow her old pupils to be so neglected. The only possible reply from Miss Susan is to make herself look as small as possible. A lieutenant comes to them, once a scorner of women, but now Spicer the bewitched. Harriet has a moment's hope. How do you do, sir? Spicer, with dreadful indifference, though she is his dear cousin. Nay, ma'am, how do you do? wistfully may i stand beside you miss susan he is a most melancholic young man and he fidgets her miss susan with spirit you have been standing beside me sir nearly all the evening spicer humbly it is strange to think that he had been favourably mentioned in dispatches indeed i cannot but be cognizant of the sufferings i cause by attaching myself to you in this unseemly manner accept my assurances ma'am that you have my deepest sympathy then why do you do it because you are her aunt ma'am it is a scheme of mine by which i am in hopes to soften her heart her affection for you ma'am is beautiful to observe and if she could be persuaded that i seek her hand from a passionate desire to have you for my aunt susan 
Do you perceive anything hopeful in my scheme, ma'am? No, sir, I do not. Spicer wanders away gloomily, takes too much to drink, and ultimately becomes a general. Ensign Blades appears, frowning, and Charlotte ventures to touch his sleeve. Ensign Blades, I have not danced with you once this evening. Blades, with the cold brutality of a lover to another she. Nor I with you, Charlotte. To Susan. May I solicit you, Miss Susan? Is Captain Brown Miss Levy's guardian? Is he a financed to her? No, sir. Then by what right, ma'am, does he interfere? Your elegant niece had consented to accompany me to the shrubbery, uh, to look at the moon. And now Captain Brown forbids it. Tis unendurable. But you may see the moon from here, sir. Blades, glancing at it contemptuously. I believe not, ma'am. The moon still shines on. Miss Susan, primly. I am happy Captain Brown for Veta. Miss Susan, tis but because he is to conduct her to the shrubbery himself. He flings out pettishly, and Miss Susan looks pityingly at the wallflowers. My poor Charlotte, may I take you to some very agreeable ladies? Charlotte, tartly. No, you may not. I am going to the shrubbery to watch Miss Livy. Please not to do that. Charlotte, implying that Miss Susan will be responsible for her early death. My chest is weak. I shall sit among the Jew. Charlotte, you terrify me. At least, please, to put this cloak about your shoulders. Nay, my dear, allow me. She puts a cloak around Charlotte, who departs vindictively for the shrubbery. She will not find Livy there, however, for next moment Miss Phoebe darts in from the back. Phoebe, in a gay whisper, Susan, another officer, Major Linkwater, rotund man, black whiskers, fierce expression. He has rushed away to destroy himself. We have been unable to find any record of the Major's tragic end. An old soldier, looking up from a card table, whence he has heard the raging of blades. Uh, Miss Livy, ma'am, what is this about the moon? Phoebe smiles roguishly looking around her i want my cloak aunt susan i have just lent it to poor charlotte parrot oh auntie and now miss livy cannot go into the shrubbery to see the moon and she is so fond of the moon miss phoebe screws her nose at him merrily and darts back to the dance but she has left a defender behind her a gallant whose name we have not succeeded in discovering Am I to understand, sir, that you are intimating disparagement of the moon? If a certain female has been graciously pleased to signify approval of that orb, any slight cast upon the moon, sir, I shall regard as a personal affront. Ha ha ha, hoity toity. But he rises, and they face each other, as Miss Susan feels, for battle. She is about to rush between their undrawn swords when there is a commotion outside. A crowd gathers and opens to allow some officers to assist a fainting woman into the tent. It is Miss Phoebe, and Miss Susan with a cry goes on her knees beside her. The tent has filled with the sympathetic and the inquisitive, but Captain Brown, as a physician, takes command, and by his order they retire. He finds difficulty in bringing the sufferer to, and gets little help from Miss Susan, who can only call upon Miss Phoebe by name. Nay, Miss Susan, tis useless calling for Miss Phoebe. Tis my fault. I should not have permitted Miss Livy to dance so immoderately. Why do they delay with the cordial? He goes to the back to close the opening, and while he is doing so, the incomprehensible Miss Phoebe seizes the opportunity to sit up on her couch of chairs, waggle her finger at Miss Susan, and sign darkly that she is about to make a genteel recovery. Where am I? Is that you, Aunt Susan? What has happened? valentine returning nay you must recline miss livy you fainted you have over fatigued yourself i remember blades enters with the cordial you will sip this cordial by your leave sir he hands it to phoebe himself she is in restored looks already miss susan i am quite recovered perhaps if you were to leave me now with my excellent aunt be off with you apple cheeks Sir, I will suffer no reference to my complexion. 
and, if I mistake not, this charming lady was addressing you. If you please, both of you. They retire together, and no sooner have they gone than Miss Phoebe leaps from the couch, her eyes sparkling. She presses the cordial on Miss Susan. Nay, drink it, Susan. I left it for you on purpose. I have such awful information to impart. Drink. Miss Susan drinks tremblingly, and then the bolt is fired. Susan, Miss Henrietta and Miss Fanny are here. Phoebe! Suddenly my eyes lighted on them. At once I slipped to the ground. You think they did not see you? I am sure of it. They talked for a moment to Ensign Blades, and then turned and seemed to be going towards the shrubbery. He had heard that you were there with Captain Brown. He must have told them. I was not. But, oh, sister, I am sure they suspect. Else why should they be here? They never frequent balls. They were suspected for a week, ever since they saw you in your veil, Phoebe, on the night of the first dance. How could they but suspect, when they have visited us every day since then, and we have always pretended that Livy was gone out? Should they see my face, it will be idle to attempt to deceive them. Idle indeed, Phoebe. The scandal! You, a schoolmistress! That is it, sister. A little happiness has gone to my head like strong waters. She is very restless and troubled. My dear, stand still and think. I dare not, I cannot. Oh, Susan, if they see me, we need not open school again. We shall starve. Phoebe, passionately. This horrid, forward, flirting, heartless, hateful little toad of a Livy. Brother James's daughter, as we call her. Tis old James's fault. Sister, when you know that James has no daughter. If he had really had one, think you I could have been so wicked as to personate her? Susan, I know not what I am saying, but you know who it is that has turned me into this wild creature. Oh, Valentine Brown, how could you? To weary of Phoebe, patient, ladylike Phoebe, the Phoebe whom I have lost, to turn from her with a, bah, you make me old, and become enamoured in the night of a thing like this. Yes, yes, indeed, yet he has been kind to us also. He has been to visit us several times. In the hope to see her, was he not most silent and gloomy when we said she was gone out? He is infatuate. She hesitates. Sister, you are not partial to him still. No, Susan, no. I did love him all those years, though I never spoke of it to you. I put hope aside at once. I folded it up and kissed it and put it away like a pretty garment I could never wear again. I but love to think of him as a noble man. But he is not a noble man, and Livy found it out in an hour. The gallant! I flirted that I might enjoy his fury. Susan, there has been a declaration in his eyes all to-night, and when he cries, Adorable Miss Livy, be mine, I mean to answer with an Oh, la, how ridiculous you are! You are much too old. I have been but quizzing you, sir. Phoebe, how can you be so cruel? Because he has taken from me the one great glory that is in a woman's life. Not a man's love, she can do without that, but her own dear sweet love for him. He is unworthy of my love. That is why I can be so cruel. Oh, dear. And now my triumph is to be denied me, for we must steal away home before Henrietta and Fanny see us. Yes, yes. Phoebe, dispirited. And tomorrow we must say that Livy has gone back to her father, for I dare keep up this deception no longer. Susan, let us go. They are going dejectedly, but are arrested by the apparition of Miss Henrietta and Miss Fanny peeping into the tent. Phoebe has just time to signify to her sister that she will confess all and beg for mercy when the intruders speak. Miss Henrietta, not triumphant, but astounded. You, Miss Phoebe? Phoebe, with bowed head. Yes. How amazing! You do not deny, ma'am, that you are Miss Phoebe. Phoebe, making confession. Yes, Fanny, I am Miss Phoebe. To her bewilderment, Henrietta and Fanny exchange ashamed glances. Miss Phoebe, we have done you a cruel wrong. Phoebe, we apologize. 
to think how excitedly we have been following her about in the shrubbery she is wearing your cloak ensign blades told us she was gone to the shrubbery and we were convinced there was no such person so of course we thought it must be you miss fanny who has looked out i can discern her in the shrubbery still she is decidedly taller than phoebe i thought she looked taller i meant to say so phoebe twas the cloak deceived us we could not see her face phoebe beginning to understand cloak you mean henrietta you mean fanny twas wicked of us my dear but we we thought that you and miss livy were the same person they have evidently been stalking charlotte in miss phoebe's cloak miss susan shudders but miss phoebe utters a cry of reproach and it is some time before they can persuade her to forgive them it is of course also some time before we can forgive miss phoebe phoebe you look so pretty are they paying you no attentions my dear phoebe is unable to resist these delightful openings the imploring looks miss susan gives her but add to her enjoyment it is as if the sense of fun she had caged a moment ago were broke loose again alas they think of none but livy they come to me merely to say that they adore her surely not captain brown he is infatuate about her poor phoebe they make much of her and she purrs naughtily to their stroking with lightning peeps at miss susan affronted providence seeks to pay her out by sending ensign blades into the tent then the close observer may see miss phoebe's heart sink like a bucket in a well miss susan steals from the tent mr blades i have been saying that if i were a gentleman i would pay my addresses to miss phoebe much rather than to her niece ma'am excuse me miss henrietta indignant that miss phoebe should be slighted so publicly sir you are a most ungallant and deficient young man really ma'am i assure you not another word sir phoebe in her most old maidish manner miss fanny miss henrietta it is time i spoke plainly to this gentleman please leave him to me surely twill come best from me indeed yes if it be not too painful to you i must do my duty miss fanny wistfully if we could remain would it be seemly miss fanny come fanny two blades sir you bring your punishment upon yourself they press phoebe's hand and go her heart returns to its usual abode blades bewildered are you angry with me miss levy oh no miss levy i have something to say to you of supreme importance to me with regard to my complexion i am aware miss levy that it has retained a too youthful bloom my brother officers comment on it with a certain lack of generosity anxiously might i inquire ma'am whether you regard my complexion as a subject for light talk no indeed sir i only wish i had it blades who has had no intention of offering but is suddenly carried off his feet by the excellence of the opportunity which is no doubt responsible for many proposals miss levy ma'am you may have it she has a great and humorous longing that she could turn before his affrighted eyes into the schoolmistress she really is she would endure much to be able at this moment to say i have listened to you ensign blades with attention but i am really miss phoebe and i must now request you to fetch me the implement under the shock would he have surrendered his palm for punishment it can never be known for she looks at him longingly lieutenant spicer enters and he mistakes the meaning of that longing look tis my dance ma'am tis not ensign blades leave us sir we have a matter of moment to discuss spicer fearing the worst his affection miss livy is not so deep as mine he is a light and shallow nature pooh you are both light and shallow natures both ma'am but he is not sure that he has not had a miraculous escape phoebe severely tis such as you with your foolish flirting ways that confuse the minds of women and make us try to be as silly as yourselves spicer crushed ma'am 
I did not mean to hurt you. She takes a hand of each and tries to advise them as if her curls were once more hidden under a cap. You are so like little boys in a school. Do be good. Sit here beside me. I know you are very brave. Ha! Ah. And when you come back from the wars, it must be so delightful to you to flirt with the ladies again. Oh, ma'am! As soon as you see a lady with a pretty nose, you cannot help saying that you adore her. Blades, in an ecstasy. Nay, I swear! And you offer to her, not from love, but because you are so deficient in conversation. Charming, Miss Livy! Phoebe, with sudden irritation. Oh, sir, go away. Go away, both of you, and read improving books. They are cast down. She has not been quite fair to these gallants, for it is not really of them she has grown weary, so much as of the lady they temporarily adore. If Miss Phoebe were to analyze her feelings, she would find that her remark is addressed to Livy, and it means, I have enjoyed for a little pretending to be you, but I am not you, and I do not wish to be you. Your glitter, and the airs of you, and the racket of you tire me. I want to be done with you, and to be back in quiet Quality Street, of which I am a part. It is really pleasant to me to know that I shall wake up tomorrow slightly middle-aged. With the entrance of Captain Brown, however, she is at once a frivol again. He frowns at sight of her cavaliers. Gentlemen, I instructed this lady to rest, and I am surprised to find you in attendance. Miss Livy, you must be weary of their fatuities, and I have taken the liberty to order your chaise. It is indeed a liberty. An outrage. I prefer to remain. Nay. I promised this dance to Ensign Blades. To me, ma'am. And the following one to Lieutenant Spicer. Mr. Blades, your arm. I forbid any further dancing. Forbid? La! Sir, by what right? By right which I hope to make clear to Miss Livy as soon as you gentlemen have retired. Phoebe sees that the declaration is coming. She steals herself. I am curious to know what Captain Brown can have to say to me. In a few minutes, Mr. Blades, Lieutenant Spicer, I shall be at your service. I trust not. I give them my word. These young gentlemen retire, treading air once more. Brown surveys her rather grimly. You are an amazing pretty girl, ma'am. But you are a shocking flirt. La! It has somewhat diverted me to watch them go down before you. But I know that you have a kind heart, and that if there be a rapier in your one hand, there is a handkerchief in the other ready to staunch their wounds. I have not observed that they bled much. The blades and the like, no. But one may, perhaps. Phoebe. Obviously the reference is to himself. Perhaps I may wish to see him bleed. Valentine. Grown stern. For shame, Miss Livy. Anger rises in her, but she wishes him to proceed. I speak, ma'am, in the interests of the man to whom I hope to see you affianced. No, she does not wish him to proceed. She has esteemed him for so long, she cannot have him debase himself before her now. Shall we? I have changed my mind. I consent to go home. Please to say nothing. Nay. I beg you. No, we must have it out. Then if you must go on, do so. But remember, I begged you to desist. Who is this happy man? His next words are a great shock to her. As to who he is, ma'am, of course I have no notion, nor I am sure have you, else you would be more guarded in your conduct. But some day, Miss Livy, the right man will come. Not to be able to tell him all, would it not be hard? And how could you acquaint him with this poor sport? His face would change, ma'am, as you told him of it, and yours would be a false face until it was told. This is what I have been so desirous to say to you, by the right of a friend. Phoebe in a low voice, but bravely. I see. Valentine, afraid that he has hurt her. It has been hard to say, and I have done it bunglingly. Ah, but believe me, Miss Livy, it is not the flaunting flower men love. It is the modest violet. The modest violet? You dare to say that? Yes, indeed. And when you are acquainted with what love really is. Love! What do you know of love? Valentine, 
a little complacently. Why, ma'am, I know all about it. I am in love, Miss Livy. Phoebe, with a disdainful inclination of the head. I wish you happy. With a lady who was once very like you, ma'am. At first Phoebe does not understand. Then a suspicion of his meaning comes to her. Not, not, oh, no. I had not meant to speak of it, but why should not I? It will be a fine lesson to you, Miss Livy. Ma'am, it is your Aunt Phoebe whom I love. Phoebe, rigid. You do not mean that. Most ardently. It is not true. How dare you make sport of her? Is it sport to wish she may be my wife? Your wife? If I could win her. Phoebe, bewildered. May I solicit, sir, for how long you have been attached to Miss Phoebe? For nine years, I think. You think? I want to be honest. Never in all that time had I thought myself in love. Your aunts were my dear friends, and while I was at the wars we sometimes wrote to each other. But they were only friendly letters. I presume the affection was too placid to be love. I think that would be Aunt Phoebe's opinion. Yet I remember, before we went into action for the first time, I suppose the fear of death was upon me. Some of them were making their wills. I have no near relative. I left everything to these two ladies. Phoebe, softly. Did you? What is it that Miss Phoebe begins to see as she sits there quietly, with her hands pressed together as if upon some treasure? It is Phoebe of the ringlets, with the stain taken out of her. And when I returned a week ago and saw Miss Phoebe, grown so tired-looking and so poor. The shock made you feel old, I know. No, Miss Livy, but it filled me with a sudden passionate regret that I had not gone down in that first engagement. They would have been very comfortably left. Oh, sir! I am not calling it love. It was sweet and kind, but... It was not love. It is love now. No, it is only pity. It is love. She smiles tremulously. You really mean Phoebe, tired, unattractive Phoebe, that woman whose girlhood is gone? Nay, impossible. Valentine, stoutly. Phoebe of the fascinating, playful ways, whose ringlets were once as pretty as yours, ma'am. I have visited her in her home several times this week. You are always out. I thank you for that. I was alone with her, and with fragrant memories of her. Memories? Yes, that is the Phoebe you love, the bright girl of the past, not the schoolmistress in her old maid's cap. There you wrong me, for I have discovered for myself that the schoolmistress in her old maid's cap is the noblest Miss Phoebe of them all. If only he would go away and let Miss Phoebe cry. When I enlisted... I remember I compared it to a garden. I have often thought of that. Tis an old garden now. The paths, ma'am, are better shaded. The flowers have grown old-fashioned. They smell the sweeter. Miss Livy, do you think there is any hope for me? There was a man whom Miss Phoebe loved, long ago. He did not love her. Now here was a fool. He kissed her once. If Miss Phoebe suffered him to do that, she thought he loved her. Yes, yes. She asks him the ten years old question. Do you opinion that this makes her action in allowing it less reprehensible? It has been such a pain to her ever since. How like Miss Phoebe. Sternly. But that man was a knave. No, he was a good man, only a little inconsiderate. She knows now that he has even forgotten that he did it. I suppose men are like that. No, Miss Livy. Men are not like that. I'm a very average man, but I thank God I am not like that. It was you, Valentine, after a pause. Did Miss Phoebe say that? Yes. Then it is true. He is very grave and quiet. It was raining, and her face was wet. You said you did it because her face was wet. I had quite forgotten. But she remembers. And how often do you think the shameful memory has made her face wet since? The face you love, Captain Brown, you were the first to give it pain. The tired eyes, how much less tired they might be if they had never known you. 
you who are torturing me with every word what have you done to miss phoebe you who think you can bring back the bloom to that faded garden and all the pretty airs and graces that fluttered round it once like little birds before the nest is torn down bring them back to her if you can sir it was you who took them away i vow i shall do my best to bring them back miss phoebe shakes her head miss livy with your help my help i have not helped i tried to spoil it all valentine smiling spoil it you mean that you sought to flirt even with me ha huh. i knew you did but that is nothing oh sir if you could overlook it i do and forget these hateful balls hateful nay i shall never call them that they have done me too great a service it was at the balls that i fell in love with miss phoebe what can you mean she was never at a ball checking himself humorously but i must not tell you it might hurt you tell me valentine gaily then on your own head be the blame it is you who have made me love her miss livy sir yes it is odd and yet very simple you who so resembled her she was for an hour ma'am you bewitched me yes i confess it but twas only for an hour how like i cried at first but soon it was how unlike there was almost nothing she would have said that you said you did so much that she would have scorned to do but i must not say these things to you i ask it of you captain brown well miss phoebe's ladylikeness on which she set such store that i used to make merry of the word i gradually perceived that it is a woman's most beautiful garment and the casket which contains all the adorable qualities that go to the making of a perfect female when miss livy rolls her eyes ha <laughs> he stops apologetically proceed sir it but made me the more complacent that never in her life had miss phoebe been guilty of the slightest deviation from the strictest propriety she shudders i was always conceiving her in your place a hurt was monstrous and fair to you i stood looking at you miss livy and sing in my mind her and the pretty things she did, and you did not do. Why, ma'am, that is how I fell in love with Miss Phoebe at the balls. I thank you. Ma'am, tell me, do you think there is any hope for me? Hope? I shall go to her. Miss Phoebe, I will say. Oh, ma'am, so reverently, Miss Phoebe, my beautiful, most estimable of women, let me take care of you for evermore miss phoebe presses the words to her heart and then drops them beautiful la aunt phoebe ah oh, ma'am you may laugh at a rough soul just so much enamoured but tis true marry me miss phoebe i will say and i will take you back through those years of hardships that have made your sweet eyes too patient instead of growing older you shall grow younger we will travel back together to pick up the many little joys and pleasures you had to pass by when you trod that thorny path alone. Can't be. Can't be. Nay, Miss Phoebe has loved me. Tis you have said it. I did not mean to tell you. She will be my wife yet. Never. You are severe, Miss Livy. But it is because you are partial to her, and I am happy of that. Phoebe, in growing horror of herself i partial to her i am laughing at both of you miss phoebe la that old thing valentine sternly silence i hate her and despise her if you knew what she is he stops her with a gesture i know what you are that paragon who has never been guilty of the slightest deviation from the strictest propriety never that garden miss livy for shame that garden has been destroyed sir the weeds have entered it and all the flowers are choked you false woman what do you mean i will tell you but his confidence awes her what faith you have in her as in my god speak i cannot tell you no you cannot it is too horrible you are too horrible is not that it yes that is it miss susan has entered and caught the last words miss susan shrinking as from a coming blow what is too horrible 
Ma'am, I leave the telling of it to her, if she dare. And I devoutly hope those are the last words I shall ever address to this lady. He bows and goes out in a dudgeon. Miss Susan believes all is discovered and that Miss Phoebe is for ever shamed. Miss Susan, taking Phoebe in her arms. My love, my dear, what terrible thing has he said to you? Phoebe, forgetting everything but that she is loved. Not terrible, glorious. Susan, tis Phoebe he loves, tis me, not Livy. He loves me, he loves me, me, Phoebe. Miss Susan's bosom swells. It is her great hour as much as Phoebe's. End of Act Three